Hi, yes, hello everyone, I'm Gavin.js and I'm here today with the second part of this tutorial on how to make voids. This is going to be the follow-up to the video where I showed you how to make this moth and animate it so that it's void friendly. So now we're going to dive into voids, particle systems, and take a look at the rules and parameters you can use to modify your void simulation. So we're just going to take our moth here and move it off to the side so we have a little bit of space to work. And then let's bring in a plane. With this plane selected, let's go over to modifiers and add a particle system. You'll see immediately that you see all of the particles there spawned in on the plane, but none of the parameters for particle systems show up in the modifiers tab. So we need to go down to the particle properties tab. So the first thing I want to do is come up here to emission and we'll see that we'll have a thousand moths spawning and they're going to spawn from the first frame to frame 200. Now, depending on what you're doing, you'll want to play around with this, but I want all of my moths to start right at the beginning and exist for the entire duration. So we're going to adjust the end frame here to one so that we have all 1000 moths starting off right there at the beginning. In fact, while we're at it, I'm just going to go ahead and bring this down to something more reasonable, like say nine. I think that looks neat. It's going to be a little bit weird if we have too, too many. So this sounds good to me. So the next thing we're going to do is go down to lifetime. And instead of having 50 here, I want it to match our end frame. And at the moment, that's 250 frames. And there's nothing wrong with going through and adjusting this manually every time you decide to have your project go longer or shorter. But just to make things a little bit more procedural, and a little bit nicer, I'm going to go to our end frame. I'm going to click copy as new driver, go to paste driver. So now that's changed that value to 250. So if we adjust our end frame, you'll see it, it'll adjust the lifetime at the same time. And that's perfect since we know that we want our voids to exist for the entire animation. Now we can just have it do that. And no matter what we do with the project settings, they will always exist for the whole duration. So now let's go down to the physics tab and let's switch this from Newtonian to voids. And just real quick, a few notes on the miscellaneous tab. We're basically going to leave it alone, but it is an important tab to know about in case you want a specific style of animation. For instance, when I first discovered Boyd's, I was working with Salmon, and all of my Boyd's decided to pitch up suddenly whenever they went up or down. And it looked really weird. So I shifted my pitch way down and it worked really well for that animation. But it makes a bit more sense for moths to have more pitch. So I'm just going to leave all of these the same. I don't feel any reason to adjust these, but be aware of them and how they'll affect your animation in case you're doing something different. We'll also want to take a look at movement. And you can have voids fly and land. And I think this would be really cool to have animations that do combination. I'm not doing that here. Maybe I'll do that in the future. So for now, we're just going to allow flight. And the first thing I want to do is bring this minimum airspeed up because there are certain instances where your voids decide, no, actually, I don't think I need to move. And having a moth just kind of hover there feels very wrong. So we're just going to go ahead and up that a little bit so that they're always moving. And also feels really high for a maximum airspeed. So I'm going to bring that down closer to three and we'll see how that affects our animation and do some more tweaks once we hit play. Just like bank, pitch, and heights, feel free to play with these until it looks good to you. This is where you get a lot of artistic direction, and you just gotta play with those values until you get something that looks like what you're going for. Now to really show off the voids, I wanna just go ahead and adjust a few things in the viewport real quick. So if we come down to render, we wanna switch from halo to collection, and immediately we'll see that they disappear. That's fine, we just haven't specified a collection. What we can go ahead and do is just make a new collection. I'm going to rename it Moths. So if we go ahead and drop our moth in there, all we need to do is select our instance collection. And once we have that there, now we can see all of our little bitty moths appearing on our plane. And if we disable show emitter, our plane won't show up in the final render, but now what we need to do is go down to viewport display and also disable show emitter. And now it looks like what we want in our viewport display. And if you don't see them appearing like this, even though you've changed those settings, make sure that your display as in viewport display is set to rendered. That way you can see exactly what geometry it is that's going to be instanced to your voids. 
all the rest of these settings in render and display are good. The only one that you may want to play around with is scale. So if we take a look at our initial geometry compared to our voids, we can see there's quite the size difference. And that's because the default value for scaling is 0.05. I think that's pretty decent personally, but I do want a little bit of randomness. So I'm going to go ahead and take our scale randomness and bump that up just a little bit so we can see our voids are now different sizes. It's not too strong, so let's bring that up a little bit more and maybe I will increase the default scale. That way we can really see the variety of scale for our voids. So now that we have our voids set up and they look pretty good, let's go ahead and play with the void brain. So honestly, separate and flock are the two main rules that I play with, but there are several others. For instance, goal is pretty good. I use that to keep them in one little area. It's also really good for getting them to move around dynamically in an environment. So we'll play around with that in a minute. A void is sort of the opposite of a goal. You set a geometry for them to go away from instead of toward. A void collision is also really good. You set up some geometry with collision and that allows the voids to go around and avoid that geometry instead of just going straight through it. Separate gives each void a radius that they try to stay away from each other. Flock makes them group together, a lot like you'll see from flocks of birds moving around in the sky. I haven't really played around with follow leader or average speed. Those two, I think, deserve a little bit further research before I talk about them. And definitely once I find a use case and I have a reason to play around with them, I'll make a follow-up video talking about them. But for now, we're not going to look at them. And then fight is really interesting because if you set up two different void simulations, you can make them enemies and they'll fly around and fight each other. And it looks really cool. But again, I haven't played around with it much myself and I haven't found much of a use case, so I'm not going to touch that much, but it's very neat. Feel free to play around with it. I think there's a lot of cool potential with it. So the first thing I'm going to do is just add in an empty. That'll just make this nice empty sphere here. And as you can see, it's also made some of our voids into empty spheres. That's just because the empty got automatically added to the moths collection. So if we just pull that out of that collection, we'll see that all of our moths will go back to normal. And so what I want to do with this empty is make it our goal. So with our emitter selected, what we can do is go in here and add goal to our list of rules. But we want to be careful when we're playing with the rules because the order does matter, or at least sometimes it matters. So as we can see, our rule evaluation is set to fuzzy, which means it's going to go through these rules in order with a little bit of fuzz. So it's not going to be completely strict, going to just follow weight separate and then flock and then goal. It'll have a little bit of fuzziness as to which one has the highest priority. And I find that this works out really well, usually. However, we can change this from fuzzy to random. So each boy is going to select a rule randomly from this list and that'll be the rule that it holds to. I think this has some interesting use cases, but it's not really what I'm looking for. And then average I think is also interesting. It's going to take the priority of all of the rules and average them out. So they'll kind of follow one rule and kind of follow another. It's not my favorite of them, but I can see the application. But for what I'm going for, fuzzy is going to work just fine. So what we're going to do is just take our goal geometry and slide it over to the side here. Let's bring our goal up to the top of the priority. And if we hit play, we'll see that they really don't care about the goal. Naturally, that's because we didn't select it as a goal. So if we just put it here under object for goal and hit play, they go shooting right towards that goal geometry. In fact, they sort of ignore the flocking behavior. They ignore separate. They just kind of settle in right at the center of that geometry. And if we still had our minimum speed set to zero, really they would have just hovered there right in the middle. They wouldn't be moving around at all. So to get the behavior that I'm really looking for, which is to have them sort of just hover around a lamp, what I'm going to do is get rid of flock because while it's really neat, it's not the effect that I'm looking for. We'll keep separate just because it would be nice if they had a little bit of personal space and they're not just running into each other. Let's go ahead and move our goal back to the origin. And now what I'm going to do is just add some collision geometry. So if we just make UV sphere, 
this will work just fine, but it won't work initially as collision geometry for our voids. But in order to be able to address this, we're first going to need to change our emitter geometry. I'm going to jump into our emitter plane and actually change this from a plane to a torus. Scale it up a little bit. So what will happen if we have our emitter geometry intersection with our collision geometry is we'll have some of our voids instance inside of our collision geometry. And that'll mean that they completely ignore that collision and none of it will interact correctly. I ran into this once and it turned out that they were just flying in and out of the lamp that I set up and it did not look very good. So if we jump out of our plane, now we can see they're all scattered about that torus. And if we go ahead and hit play, they'll just completely ignore that sphere. Because like I said, we haven't set this up for collision yet. What we need to do is select our sphere, go into modifiers, and under physics, hit collision. Now if we hit play, they'll bounce off of it, but they're still trying to get to at that goal. And this is still not what we're looking for. So we have to tell them that it's a collision object and to avoid it. So with our emitter selected, let's go back in, add avoid collision. And just like with goal, we need to give it an object to avoid, but we don't see that option here under avoid collision. So what we need to do is go ahead and check deflectors and we need to go back up to movement and add a collision collection. So let's make a new collection, call it colliders, just for the sake of organization. And now we can take our sphere and move it into colliders. Back in our voids, we put colliders in collision collection. And now if we hit play, they're still gonna smack into it. Some of this can be handled if you adjust the look ahead amount. This is the number of seconds in the simulation that they'll look ahead of themselves and test for collision geometry. But really what we need to do, since we have our rule evaluation set to fuzzy, we need to take our avoid collision and bring it up to the top. So now if we go back to the beginning of our simulation and hit play, they won't just smack right into it they'll sort of start moving around but there's kind of just stuck to the outside this is definitely better but what we can do to make this a little bit more interesting is go up to our minimum airspeed and turn that up so that way they're less likely to get stuck on that surface and they'll kind of fly around it maybe make our maximum airspeed a little bit higher and now they're really circling around it Let's actually bring that down just a little bit so that they're not flying off into the distance. And we still see that we have some getting caught on the bottom here. You just kind of got to play around with it some. It can be a little bit annoying at times, but play around with it and you'll be able to get something that you like. Do know that if you make your collision geometry too big, they're more likely to just keep smacking into it repeatedly instead of going fully around it. And also, According to the Blender documentation, voids don't really handle concave geometry very well. Just things to keep in mind. But with all of that said, that's essentially the animation done. The one thing that we have left to do is add a little bit more variety to the animation of our moths. Because as of right now, we have one moth in our moths collection. And if you can't tell, they're all flapping in sync. Which isn't great. I don't love it. So what we're going to do is just focus back in on our original geometry here, and we're going to go ahead and duplicate it. Let's rename our moths just to keep things organized. And now what we can do is select our second moth, and where we set this driver for our shape keys, what we can do is go into our cosine function and add pi over 3. What I found is if I just add some fraction of pi to our cyclic animation, it just helps to make it look less like they're all doing exactly the same animation. So let's do that with our third moth, but this time subtracting pi over 3. And now we can see them all angled differently. If we hit play, they're kind of in phase, but they're all out of phase just enough that if we focus back on our emitter, since all three moths are in the moths collection, our voids are randomly using one of the three different moths, and so they're not all flapping perfectly in sync anymore. Let me do just a couple of weeks real quick just to get this a little bit more visually interesting and then we'll get our final render set up. If you've made it this far into the video, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed talking about voids. I think they're a really cool concept in general. 
I intend to do more with them in the future and as I explore more aspects of them in Blender, I'll definitely be making more tutorials on how I approach voids. Otherwise, do the YouTube things, like and subscribe, and I'd really appreciate it. It really helps out the channel. And until next time, bye.